Welcome to Nippersink Hall. I'm here today to find out how to move sheep with sheep dogs. In exchange for the knowledge, I'm gonna be making a plowman's lunch for Gordon and I. For the ingredients, I'm heading up to Amory, Wisconsin for some herbal tea. And then a little stop off at Jung Seed, and then it's off to Anarchy Acres for some heritage flour. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Good morning, girls. I'm Inga, and I love everything about farming. Midwestern farms are a bounty of good food made by good people. I love being able to travel to search out good ingredients. Cooking is all about what's seasonal, what's fresh. Every day can be filled with good food, good friends, and a beautiful herd of cows. Welcome to the farm. Good girl. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, big on fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. Gordon, it's so lovely to be out here today and with the sheep and the beautiful dog. And this is Storm, right? That's Storm. And he's kind of a champion sheep dog. Yeah, he's done very well. He's he's won quite a few trials and he was a reserve champion last year in the US. So. That's amazing. I love it that even though I'm petting him, he's got his eye on he's he's not gonna stop working. Well, they don't stop working, they have their that's their job and that's what they're bred for. So they must take a lot of pride in it too. I mean, does he see himself as kind of the leader of the pack, or is that your job? That's my job. You're supposed to be the leader of the pack of your dogs and like he works for me, but it's keeping him happy at his work as well. And how often do you have to work with him to keep him? Is he just learned everything he needs to know and now he's ready to go? Or do you have to kind of maintain that uh, training? Once they're trained, all you ever do is polish things up. Okay. That's all you ever do. You know, they're, only, they're only ever trained once. Okay. We can't train twice. And that's what you do here is you train dogs for other people too. Yes, I help people. I. Um, teach people that how to work their dogs and how to make them better. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people can work their dogs, but it's trying to get them to be better to compete and at sure. a higher level. And I didn't know this about the United States. I'm, whenever I think of sheepdog trials or even sheep themselves, I think of the UK. And, uh, you know, I was able to walk through sheep farm after sheep farm when I was in England. Uh, but this is a thing here in the United States? Yes, it's a big thing all over the world now. It's um, UK is probably where it started uh -huh. as a number of sheep, but it has grew and grew and grew until people call it a sport. It's trial, but there's thousands of people does it now. Wow! And what happens at the trial? Like, how are is it? You're judging the dog, or you're what is what is being judged? You're judging how the dog handles the sheep uh -huh. on lines. The first thing he has to do is outrun, lift the sheep towards you, fetch them round you drive, back, shed or pen, it can be either way. Mm -hmm. You have a time limit and it's done within that time but it's not a race inside that time. Yeah. You can use it down to the last seconds if you want. It's about how good can you get your lines, how nice the dog walks the sheep and it's up to the judge to take the points off after that. Interesting. And how did you end up in Wisconsin? I moved to Missouri. Um, Almost two years ago, and I was there for six months, and I moved up here. It's nicer to up here. To the most beautiful place on earth, right? It's, it's very pretty. It's very pretty. <laughs> and the winters, you're okay with the winters? So far. So far. <laughs> People say it can get bad, but last year was fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully this year was going to be fine, too. Hopefully. Hopefully. Look at the Irish. <laughs> right. <laughs> When you have this dog, like Storm, is he a part of your family? Is he like any other dog sitting on the couch with you watching TV? Or do you have to treat him a little bit differently because he's a working dog? No, Storm's never been in the house in his life. He stays in his kennel, but um, he's my pet. He's my partner. Mm -hmm. And like, I wouldn't allow anything to happen to him. Sure. But he's treated as a dog. Yeah. So he has a job to do, and that's the way he's treated, but he's not treated badly. And yeah, but essentially he is that uh, an employee. He yes, is, he's, yeah. a, he's a working machine. Yeah. They're, they're not a dog to be played with. See, I would get a dog if I didn't have to play with it all the time and it didn't have to come in my house yeah. and get dog hair all over the place. <laughs> but that's, that's what they're bred for. 
when we lived in Virginia, my brother still lives there, we had a sheep herd and he always had border collies. Uh, and he would work with the sheep and we'd bring the cows yep. in to be milked with like that. Is there something about the border collie that makes them perfect for this job? They're the best dog at reading sheep. They're the best dog at doing the work because they're, it's naturally there. They're yeah. naturally herding dogs. They naturally go around and fetch the sheep to their master. So you wouldn't want to like get like a Shih Tzu or something out here herding sheep? No. <laughs> no. Not, not my style. <laughs> Is there any other breeds of dog that do well with this kind of work? They're the Australian Shepherd dog, but um, they I see them don't a lot do the farms. same job. They don't, yeah. yeah. Other dogs are, they're called drovers, uh -huh. so they are used for tight pen work. Okay. And like driving on the road years ago, where they had to drive stock from home to market. Sure. They were drovers, as they call them, but there's still nothing to touch the border collie. Yeah. Because he can do all jobs. They're very nice dogs. What would you tell somebody who wants to get into training dogs uh, for this kind of work? Is it all about the patience? Well, the first thing, if somebody wants to get into this job of doing herding sheep, and they need to go and get themselves a very well-bred pup. Mm -hmm. And they also need, when the pup starts working, is to go to somebody that can tell them the proper way to get it trained, how to train it, and the person helps them and the young pup to grow up together in their training. Yeah, because you only get one shot. You only get one shot of it. That's my advice. It's amazing to me watching you around here how you can control a uh, storm with just a whistle. Is it? Is that how he's trained or is there other aspects of it? He starts out on voice commands. Mm -hmm. The whistles come second and the whistles are used for distance. Okay. That the dog can hear you at a greater distance. And a dog will easily hear his whistles at least half a mile away. Wow. It's not a problem to him. I imagine that you and Storm have to have a certain amount of bonding because you know, working together and, and having to trust each other and communicate without words. I call it the leader of the pack. You must be the leader of the pack to your dog. If you're, if you're not the leader of the pack, you're nothing to him. Yeah. You're just a person. Uh -huh. But when you when you really lead him, he gets closer to you, and he, he will do more for you. You can ask any questions you like of him. That's amazing. Well, you're a world, world champion, and I would love to go out with the sheep and see how a world champion does this. OK. <laughs> It's a treat to be up here at Red Clover Herbal Apothecary Farm. I've always used herbs only in culinary sense and the pestos and things that I make, but I'm excited to meet with Nancy here today and find out what you do here on this beautiful farm, Nancy. Hi, Inga. Hi, nice I'm glad you. you're here. Thank you. We're growing over 50, 60 different kinds of medicinal and culinary herbs, and we harvest them. We'll make teas. Uh, we'll dry some of the dried herbs, we'll turn into oils that will later get beeswax added to them and we'll make salves. We tincture, so, and then we take them to the farmer's market. We provide seasonal uh, CSA herbal shares. Well, let me talk, ask about that because when I think of CSAs, I think of uh, vegetables, you're getting a box once a week. How does right. it work with the herbs? Well, you don't get a box every week because you don't need a box every week. So it's seasonal. We have a spring CSA share, we have a summer one, and then we combine a fall winter one. And we work with uh, what's going on with the body that time of year. So say in the fall and winter, it would be more respiratory, protecting you from colds, flus, viruses, stuff sure. like that. So what are you getting in the box then? Just, is it tea and medicine? Yes, so in the winter one, you'd get elderberry syrup, you get a sore throat spray, uh, some winter wellness tincture, uh, some cold season tea, maybe a warm cold congestion balm that you can rub on your chest. And What a great idea. Thank you. So tell me one thing as a farmer, I'm sure you're always thinking about your soils and right, right. how to enhance that. Do you have to worry about fertility with herbs as Absolutely. Well? I didn't think I did when I first started out because in the wild, they're just growing wonderful. You don't do anything to them. But there's uh, dead plants around them building the soil all the time. So we really do have to pay attention to that. 
We grow cover crops of oats and red clover. We lay down comfrey leaves, which add a lot of nutrients to the soil. Sometimes we'll make a nettle tea, oh. strong nettle tea. Uh, and then after that ferments for a while, we'll spray that around the plants. But we have to continually be conscious about building the soil. Sure. Because the plants take a lot out of sure. the soil. And it's really, that's where the health of the plants come from, That's right? right. You need healthy soil for healthy plants, for healthy people. Is it important when you're thinking about planting to have a, a diversity of, of herbs, not just for the business side of it, but for the health of the plants? Yes, they help each other. We try to do as much companion planting as possible. Like our yarrow and our mint, we plant side by side because they know no boundaries, they'll take over. So if you put them together, they keep each other in check. We plant our chamomile next to plants that have a lot of essential oils like lavender, lemon balm, and that enhances the essential oils of them. Some plants uh, will help deter bugs off of other plants, so we do think of that. This is really exciting. Well, I would love to see some more of the farm. Uh, sure. Really specifically, I'd love to see some of your cover crops because that's, okay. that's what I'm thinking in my mind right now for my farm. Okay, let's head down to Garden 3. We've got some oats growing okay. down there. I'd love to I can give you a hand with this. So Nancy, what's the purpose of these oats? These oats serve uh, three purposes, probably more than that. One of the main reasons is because it enhances the soil. It helps build healthy soil. But we also use them medicinally in our teas and tinctures. See the seed on the top here? It's called milky oat seed. Milk doesn't come out yet, but in a week from now, when you squeeze this, milk's gonna pop out. That's the time to harvest this. It's the best plant medicine we have in the Western world for restoring the nervous system. No kidding! Frazzled, burnt out, anxiety. It's just, it's like food. You can have it every day. And what we do, we will cut the plant. Say we'll take a bunch like this, we'll cut it with a scissor and then we'll bring it in the house and we strip off these seeds. You can see I'll strip a bunch off and we'll fill them in a jar. We'll fill a jar full of, with these seeds and then we'll pour organic alcohol over it and they'll bathe in that for several months and that pulls some medicinal parts out. Nancy, it's so exciting to be able to learn about how crops, like cover crops, have a lot more purpose than just building the soil or mm -hmm. seeing that we can have healthy lives from healthy plants. I wanted to offer something healthy, rejuvenating for a nice non-alcoholic drink. Can you kind of help me pick out some stuff for some tea? Absolutely. Let's go up to the drawing room and okay. see what we have up there. So Nancy, I'm excited to gather up some of these herbs. What do you think would be visually appealing and also taste delicious for this hot summer day we're having? Let's see how well visually I'm going to calendula right away. Oh, how about that. that? Yeah. We can mix it with some chamomile. They go very nice together. Okay. And that's a nice calming herb. Nice calming and tasting if you don't oversteep it. And then I would add some red clover and some lemon balm, which is really tasty and really cooling. That's this would be a nice combination. I decided to make a pit stop in Randolph, Wisconsin to visit Jung Seed Company. I'm sure at one point or another, all of us have had a Jung Seed catalog show up in our mailbox. And I wanted to find a little bit more about the family and uh, the history of Jung Seed. I know that one of the family members, Nathan, is out in the daylily field, so let's go catch up with him. Nathan, so nice to meet you. Nice having you here. It's incredible to be out here. You know, I've been getting the Jung catalog for ever since I was a little girl, and now I feel like I'm standing on the front cover of it being out here in the daylilies. Thank you for coming. It's a great company that you guys have here, and, I, and one thing I love about learning more about Wisconsin and traveling around Wisconsin is learning about these amazing Wisconsin companies. Can you tell me a little bit about how it started? Sure. My uh, great-grandfather started the company back in 1907. Um, it all started when he was um, a young boy with his family of 10 siblings um, working in the garden. His job was to collect the seeds from the garden to save for the next year. Um, he started collecting a few extra seeds, saving some to sell them around town. 
um, and that kind of got him started into um, the horticulture business. And from there, he went on to business school, came back, um, put a printing press in his parents' kitchen, um, punched a hole in the wall for the gasoline engine on the outside, and got going from there. First and that's catalog. Where they would print out the catalogs. Yeah, he would and print, printed out his catalogs. The first catalog was printed in his parents' kitchen. Um, it uh, started out with 400 catalogs that first year in 1907, and has grown from there. Now we have three million catalogs that we send out in the spring. We have two editions of the catalog, a spring edition and a fall edition. And we, like I said, send out three million catalogs in the spring and about three quarters of a million catalogs in the fall. And now you're growing a lot of the, the stock that you sell right here in Wisconsin, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We grow about 50 to 60 percent of the plants that we sell right here on our farms. We have about 250 acres of farms on three different spots here in the Randolph area. That's a lot um, of flowers. It, it is. It's a lot of flowers. Um, when they're in bloom, it's a, it's a pretty sight. And we've got fields of daylilies, fields of peonies, fields of iris. Well, I'd love to take a look at these daylilies. There's some really beautiful variety. Sure, let's take a walk. Okay. How did you get involved in the family business? When I was quite young, around four or five years old, I used to come to our greenhouses and propagate geraniums with my grandfather. I was always very close with my grandpa, and he kind of took me wherever he went um, anytime I wasn't in school, and he was willing to bring me along. We'd either work at the greenhouses or we'd go to the garden centers, and he'd be helping customers, answering questions, and I'd be in the back wrapping up plants for the customers who came in to buy them on that particular day. And as soon as eighth grade was over, I started working here. Worked summers all through high school and college, and as soon as I graduated college, I came back, and I've been working here full time for over 10 years now. I love hearing stories like that. I have a similar experience growing up with my grandfather feeding calves and baling hay and really kind of seeing, I think we see things through their eyes and their passion and it's yeah. easy to kind of fall in love with what they're doing and want to do it ourselves. Very true. We're here in Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin at Anarchy Acres, where rural meets the residential. And here, Charlie is growing different varieties of heritage wheat. Let's go meet him and find out why he's so passionate about it. Hey, Charlie, how are you doing? Inga, how are you? Good, nice to see you. Thanks for coming out. This is looking really nice out here. I would agree, and I'm so happy to be standing here. This, uh, this is a five acre field of turkey red wheat. I planted it last, um, September. Wow. And I'm very anxious to harvest it. That will be in a matter of days. <laughs> well, hopefully it dries out enough around here and you can get in here and harvest it. I don't know if it's ever going to dry this year, but <laughs> if it does, I will be here to harvest it. How many acres did you start out with? I know that this is kind of a passion of yours to grow these, would you call them heritage varieties of wheat? Heritage varieties of Wisconsin. Wisconsin wheat. The, my, my particular interest is in the wheat that grew in Wisconsin 100 years ago and 200 years ago. So that's my focus. And yes, I started out a lot smaller. My first plot was probably 10 by 10. It's gone up a little bit every year. That's exciting. So why was it important for you to start growing your own wheat? This is very ambitious thing to do. Yeah, it is. I started as a baker, a home baker, and just got really passionate about it. And I got a pile of books. The first thing that came was grinding. I started hand, hand grinding uh, on a stone mill, my own flour probably back in the 1990s and I had access to grains from my uncle's farm and got, got a taste for that. Then I discovered a cookbook that told me that I wasn't uh, a real baker if I wasn't also growing my own grain. <laughs> <laughs> so this book advised that I start growing in my backyard. And once I had a backyard big enough, I live on a four acre homestead now, I could start growing it. And that was maybe in 2005. I love it that you didn't let the fact that you didn't have 150 acres stop you, that you're yes. doing it on what you have. I think that's important for people to realize that they can do something on the property that they have. Yeah, Inga, it's even more extreme, and I can prove it, because I have a friend in Hawaii who's growing wheat on the side of a mountain in Hawaii, and it's from seed that I grew here in Wisconsin. Now, why do you think farmers moved away from these varieties that you're trying to save? There's several things. Practicality. Uh, productivity, the, okay. the marketplace is um, brutal these days. That extra um, bushel or two per acre means a lot. Yeah. And over time, uh, there's definitely a demand for productivity. And this field is not as productive, okay? Right. We're taking care of the soil, we're doing a lot of good things, but we're not getting 100 bushels per the acre out of this but field. But the flavor is different. We're getting flavor and maybe better nutrition. And knowing what I know about the 20 varieties of wheat that were reported being grown in Wisconsin 100 years ago, 
I think some of them probably got thrown out for random reasons. And I want to grow them all out, taste them all, and see if something was left behind that I think should be back here in the year 2020 or whenever it's grown out by. Tell me why you think it's important to save these varieties. Seed represents everyone that's ever grown that seed. And if you don't believe how important it is, I can tell you a story. Because I have turkey red in my test plot that uh, I grew out from a sample of turkey red seed that came from the USDA seed bank in Idaho. The seed that I got um, was preserved by some Russian scientists in the 1920s at the Vavilov Institute in St. Petersburg. And they preserved it in St. Petersburg during the siege of Leningrad against the Nazi onslaught. That's crazy. Okay? The Vavilov Institute is the biggest seed, seed bank in the world. They had tons of food there during the deadliest siege in human history. Those scientists chose to starve rather than eat the seed, including the seed that's growing in my backyard. That's amazing. Inga, would you die for that, okay? I don't know if I would. I... And, I, and I prove this because I've emailed the folks at the Vavilov Institute in St. Petersburg. Um, something like 15 of their botanists actually died protecting this pile of seed during World War II, the siege of Leningrad, Boy, rather it, than eat it. It really makes it so much more important now after hearing that story, and that's incredible. Food matters. Seed matters. It's meaningful to me. It's beautiful to me, and I wish it were to more people. Mm, well, Charlie, that is fantastic. I would love to take some of your flour to make a beautiful loaf of bread. I'd love to give uh, you some. To celebrate this beautiful seed. So, All right. Thank you. Thanks, Inga. I wanted to bring a plowman's lunch with me to celebrate uh, with Gordon here in the pasture and have a nice little picnic. Plowman's lunch is something that my father and I often have in the summertime when it's nice out after we've got the morning chores done. It's a nice, simple meal and it's delicious. It's probably one of my favorite meals to have. And it's really simple. It's just basically bread, uh, some cheese, some chutney, nice homemade butter, and a little bit of pickles. You can add some meat if you like. My dad's a vegetarian, so we always just have the veggie version of the plowman's lunch. So I've already made up a loaf with me. I knew I wasn't gonna have an oven out here in the pasture, so I made up a loaf ahead of time. But I have three cups of Anarchy Acres uh, of the, the wheat in my pan already. And it's really wonderful to be able to work with this flower, the, these seeds that are ancient, that are now continue to be grown here in Wisconsin, and we get to make bread with it. So to the flour, I'm gonna add a quarter teaspoon of yeast and then some salt. And again, this is one of my favorite bread recipes. My dad makes this a lot, and he'll bring me out a little bit of bread every once in a while when he's making it. It's so easy. So don't blink, don't get out of your chair. You gotta sit right here and see how easy this is, and it's gonna go quick. And then I have some warm water here. It's 105 degrees. I need warm water to be able to activate the yeast. And I need one and a half cups of water. Okay, but I'm just gonna give the yeast and the salt a little bit of a stir and incorporate that in. And then I'm just gonna add my water right to it. So it's really simple. It's yeast, salt, flour, water. And then stir this. And you wanna stir it until it gets a little bit shaggy. It's gonna be sticky and icky, but it's gonna turn out to be a delicious bread. I'm gonna get in here with my hands a little bit to help form this. And this is, I know a, a lot of folks like to make sourdough with starters and they're delicious, but I just, I like to make it easy and a little bit more simple. So now the dough's looking a little shaggy, uh, but it's come together and this is what you want it to look like. Now you're gonna oil your uh, clean bowl, put this dough inside of it, cover it with plastic wrap and let that sit for 12 hours. After 12 hours, you take it out of the bowl, put, flop it on your countertop, put a little bit of uh, plastic on top, and let that rise again for two hours. After two hours, you wanna put your oven on to 475. A half an hour before you put your bread in, put your cast iron skillet in that oven to get nice and hot, and then pop your bread in, put the uh, top on, bake it for 30 minutes, and then remove the lid, and then bake it again for 15 minutes to get a nice crust on it. So that's your super simple bread recipe for today. So I'm gonna set this off to the side. And what we use at home is we use this little uh, bowl here with the ridges so we can get the ridges on the bread like so, so it looks like artisan bread. 
And this one's a little bit flat, so I probably let this rise for too long. If you let it rise for too long, the yeast breaks down and it doesn't rise as much, but that's okay, it's still gonna taste great. I'm gonna cut this bread open. And it's got a nice crust on it. And this is the perfect bread for a plowman's lunch. Well, I've got my bread baked, I've got the tea steeping, uh, the pickles are set, I've got a little chutney and some cheese and some fresh butter, and I think we're ready for a plowman's picnic lunch. Crusty kettle bread slathered with creamy Wisconsin butter and chutney add a tangy twist to this plowman's lunch. Aged cheddar is a must, nutty and mellow. Piping hot herbal tea, a perfect pick-me-up. Well, I hope this has inspired you to have a plowman's picnic out in the pasture, and I hope you'll gather with us next time around, around the, the farm, farm table. table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, big on fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television.